10 after already. Um, so hi everybody, thanks for attending today's event. Um, this is part of the Neurodiversity Faculty and Staff Education Series, which is, as well as other events that I'll mention in a few minutes, generously funded by the Olitsky Family Foundation. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm Amy Edwards. I'm the director of the Drexel Autism Support Program, otherwise known as DASP. Um, before we get started, I just want to let you know a couple um, things. Our next event in this series will be January 29th. Dr. Kristen Betts from the School of Education is going to be presenting on neurodiversity and neurobiology in education in the workforce. And then on March 30th and 31st, we're going to have our second Autism at Work Summit University series in collaboration with SAP at the Union League. private practice and is the director of the Ruttenberg Autism Center. He is also the author of Putting It Together, the Autism and Asperger's Handbook. Dr. Mitchell has many years of experience as an educator, evaluator, licensed psychologist, school psychologist, program developer, advocate, researcher, and administrator. With a focus on autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, he has been very active in providing guidance and workshops at regional conferences, universities, and various agencies specializing with autism. He continues to build collaborative partnerships between families, schools, universities, mental health agencies, professionals, self-advocates, and others in the ASD community. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mitchell. Thanks, everybody. Is this, uh, can you guys hear me with the, the lapel pin? Okay, great. Very nice. Um, so I like to move a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit ADHD in that respect, so, uh, so try to bear with me here. Um, but um, we're going to skip over the objective, which you already know, because you signed up for this thing, so you know why you're here. Very nice. Um, let's see. There we go. Uh, part of what we want to do today is to kind of give people a, a little bit of a brief overview, uh, just, just so I know kind of who the audience is. Uh, how many folks here are kind of involved in the autism community on a professional level, either by um, uh, engaging with folks uh, and, and guiding folks through either the college experience or other experiences in their lives? Okay, we got uh, a few folks, very nice. Uh, and any, anybody willing to uh, uh, identify as a family member or a self-advocate as well? I'm going to raise my hand for that one too. Yeah. All right. So we got some personal and some professional connections here. Um, so I want I want today to be as interactive as possible. So if there are situations that um, that you'd like to throw out there and kind of you know open up for a little bit of discussion or comment or some questions that you may have, uh, feel free to uh, to shout out or shoot up a hand or what have you, and uh, we'll see if we can work those those pieces in as well. Um, I have more material here than we're going to be able to get to uh, in an hour and a half, so, uh, but I want to make, make sure that folks, if, if you come in with, with a particular um, question or, or concern, that we address those as well. So, um, so we'll start off, I, I want to go through kind of just the, an overview of autism and then getting into uh, the, the definition of what neurodiversity is and then of course getting into how we can support neurodiversity here on campus as well as in communities and so on where, uh, where folks eventually transition into or are coming from and part of but then transitioning into once they leave universities. Um, of course we say, you know, if, if we're going to uh, be providing this thing that we call education, uh, there should be kind of a, a point to that. We're going somewhere. We're trying to live a better life in some way. And one of the things that, that brings me to Drexel time and time again is not just there's a wonderful university, but also that folks that I'm working with in the community, in my private practice with uh, Ruttenberg Autism Center, some of those folks are coming from universities, sometimes from Drexel or other regional uh, institutions, where they're struggling to find that fit back into uh, the world again. Um, so this, on campus, we may have supports, but we also want to prepare for that transition back into the world. Uh, that's really where the, the, uh, you know, the value of what we're trying to do today comes in handy is 
preparing not just in the kind of um, kind of uh, niche setting of a university, but being able to translate those skills into our daily lives. So we'll be talking about that later. Um, I'm just going to go through a little bit of. Um, actually, let's let's start with a uh, a nice little video here. This is. Um, uh, from the perspective of, this is a, a, a boy on the spectrum, but thinking about what it's like to come on to, say, a, a campus or an overwhelming kind of uh, sensory experience, if you will, for someone who may be uh, you know, experiencing that kind of overload. Um, so this is, uh, I think it's uh, by a group in Britain, but uh, this is a boy in the mall, but in some ways can kind of mirror what it's like to um, to be coming onto campus. So just to kind of give us a little framework here. I'm autistic, and I just get too much information. So far, um, what kinds of, and I'm going to turn this into a class all of a sudden, <laughs> what kinds of themes did you see popping up here? What were some of those experiences? Sounds, smell, vision. Say a little louder. Sounds, smell, vision. Sounds and vision, yep, absolutely. So that kind of overwhelming kind of sensory processing happening in those respects, yeah. Any other themes that you saw pop up? This uh, self-coping skill of this worker by his mother. Right, right. So trying to count and then, of course, his mother kind of pulling him along. And there was, a, and there was a, a kind look on mom's face, but not necessarily fully kind of comprehending what was happening. Yeah, absolutely. Other pieces? There's a disconnect between the internal experience versus the external view of that experience. Right, internal versus external, absolutely. Yeah, so, so there, you know, the external may have been a you know, lovely setting in a mall, you know, going to you know, experience that as, as a kid, but, um, but internally, you know, of course, that's a very different experience. It can be very intimidating, yeah. Uh, any any uh, any themes of what um, other folks were um, were exhibiting, uh, folks that they came across? What was that reaction? Staring judgment. Staring judgment. Yep. Kind of dismissal, standoff, and, and so on. You know, just allowed allowing this mom to kind of be solo by herself, and so on. Yeah. I was at, uh, any, you guys, some folks may have, may have known uh, Camelback Mountain. I was, um, so I was recently up at, uh, up at I guess it was, the, it was a, the mountain coaster where they have the, uh, the Halloween kind of decorations up there. And, uh, and we were standing in line waiting to, you know, to hop on the coaster and to go up to the top and come down and see all the <laughs> scary decorations and so on. And there was a, a young boy who went ahead of us. It was very excited to go, but as soon as he started going up the hill, started to have a reaction and, uh, and, and started to have a meltdown. And of course, um, uh, the folks that were on the, on the ride 
uh, you know, they had to shut down the ride and kind of get folks up there to help out. And the father was behind him, and so they had to let the father out and you know to calm him down. And what we found was that the community was very, very calm, very uh, nurturing. Uh, and they were really trying to troubleshoot back and forth. So the mother was down at the base talking on the walkie-talkie, trying to talk him down. It became kind of a community experience to bring this kid's over sensory overload down to a reasonable level so that he could hop back on the car and make his way down the mountain. Eventually, I think they actually uh, took a four-wheeler up and, and brought him down that way. Um, but that's the kind of daily kind of uh, experience that, that these kids or young adults will have. We have a choice as a community, whether we're going to be meeting them halfway or at least, or maybe even more than halfway to kind of guide them through those difficult moments, or whether we're going to be standoffish and allow them to kind of struggle in their, in their own space. Um, so we all have that ability to do, reach out and do something helpful, or at least offer something helpful, and that's part of what we're here to talk about today, how we do that. Um, as far as diagnosis is concerned, uh, we're talking about the um, uh, kind of a, an umbrella if you will, or a, a spectrum of diagnoses that were combined into, into one diagnosis, uh, autism spectrum disorder, uh, back in 2013 with the DSM-5. Previously, uh, it was a bunch of different di uh, disorders. You may hear these terms being thrown around, Asperger's, PDD-NOS, RETS, uh, childhood disintegrative disorder, um, were all combined under one category of autism spectrum disorder. That means that we have folks that are very independent in many things that they do in life, not all things, but many things that they do in life, all the way to, down to folks where um, just even you know, communicating or taking care of oneself or just you know, being exposed to the world can be completely overwhelming and, and incapacitating. So that's an entire range of folks. Um, the, uh, the two main categories uh, that we're looking at with autism would be the deficits in social communication or social interaction and the patterns of behavior. So those two areas um, being uh, uh, kind of stuck in uh, certain routines and so on, that would be the behavioral piece. Uh, and then, of course, the, the social communication piece, how you interact. It's, it, you know, you may have the the, uh, the core communication skills, the semantics, but you may not have the pragmatic communication skills to function in the world. Uh, and so that may be a continuous struggle. So in order to meet that definition of ASD, you would need to have uh, representative um, uh, uh, symptoms in each of those areas. That doesn't mean that everyone who is neurodiverse automatically identifies on the autism spectrum. Uh, there are some that could be identified that choose not to be identified on the autism spectrum. Neurodiversity is a wider umbrella, but for the purposes of, of ASD, this is, this is what the DSM says. Um, part of that is often the sensory aspect that we just saw. Part of it is you know, things like, uh, um, like uh, uh, kind of rigid thinking, thinking about things in a certain way or being fixated on a certain subject or talent that one might have comes in real handy on a college campus when you're really kind of you know, keyed into your major but it could be a little bit more difficult when students are trying to get through some of the, uh, the, the core curriculum uh, that isn't necessarily part of their interest. So the restricted interest can, can be a curse, it can also be a blessing at the same time. Um, uh, the skills that folks have, this is, this is a, a cake that was made by a neurodiverse young person. Uh, beautiful cake, lovely flowers, maybe a slight miscalculation in the translation of the instructions. So for folks that can't see it, this, uh, this cake says, happy birthday, Adam, with blue flowers. You can just imagine the person reading the instructions on the, little, on the little slip of paper. Okay, happy birthday, Adam, with blue flowers. That must be the person's name, Adam with blue flowers. But this is what we end up with. So again, trans, uh, sometimes getting a little bit lost in translation there. Um, as far as severity levels, ASD does, uh, uh, in, as far as the DSM is concerned, does identify three different levels. Uh, level one requiring support, level two requiring substantial support, level three requiring very substantial support. Those are very vague descriptions. There are some folks that are called the traditional Asperger's or, or the, the high-functioning ASD, if you will, or high-functioning autism, also labeled as uh, HFA. Um, that may, in fact, require support at level one, 
but in some situations, they may require very substantial support. Um, so there may be certain things that are overwhelming, but not all things that are overwhelming. So just because you're at a certain place on the spectrum doesn't necessarily mean that a certain level of support is automatically afforded to you or that you require that level of support. Um, so there's, there are some distinctions there as well. Okay. Oops. Not used to this laptop. Okay, here we go. So over time, there's, a, there's kind of a sorted history, uh, and we won't spend a lot of time on this, but it's a little bit of a sorted history uh, of diagnosis in the autism community, um, all the way from you know back uh, you know in the days of you know people you know being thought to uh, to have a demonic possession with exorcism and so on. Back in the 1950s, uh, it was started to be called infantile autism or infantile schizophrenia, which was supposedly caused by mothers, the old refrigerator mother theory. That, uh, that stated that uh, since mothers were so cold and un unloving to their children, that's what made them autistic. And there are still some remnants of that that are kind of hanging around in our, in our culture today that blame mothers for the genetic predispositions of their children, even though that's not something that mothers can control, obviously. Um, all the way, and then of course getting into the 60s and 70s, the institutionalization that as soon as your child may have been diagnosed with autism, it was thought that the best place for them would have been an institution. They need to remain there for the rest of their lives and be separated from society. We know that that did a heck of a lot of damage. All of these kind of perspectives do a lot of damage. Um, now we're looking at uh, the autism spectrum disorder and multi-systems collaboration, which is why we're here today. We aren't locking people up. We aren't, uh, we aren't, you know, the men in the white coats are gonna come and permanently take you away. We're talking about what are the strengths and, and, and kind of functional fixations, if you will, that allow people on the autism spectrum not just to be uh, part of our society, but to drive certain uh, narratives in our society and certain industries even, um, that they have come to um, maybe stereotypically be associated with, but rightly have the ability and the, 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 the right to uh, to be able to be included and then uh, celebrated in, in those professions. Uh, and we see some of that preparation happening here on campus. Um, so we've, you know, several years ago, the um, uh, folks in the communities developed Autism Awareness Month, uh, which was the, the month of April. Uh, folks in the, in the disability community and, and uh, uh, self-advocates in the autism community specifically um, wanted to move that bar, just, not just from being aware of autism, uh, but being accepting or understanding or even appreciating autism. So the idea of, of uh, autism awareness is now being called Autism Acceptance Month uh, and eventually moving toward a place of Autism Appreciation Month where we appreciate the gifts that folks in the autism uh, community bring to us, but also appreciate the struggles that, that occur as a result. Uh, Sure, sure. Um, so the, uh, the numbers keep on shifting depending on which, um, which study you're looking at and how this, the numbers are counted. For, so from an epidemiological perspective, uh, we're looking at somewhere between one in 40 and one in 60 individuals um, are estimated to be uh, somewhere on the autism spectrum. Some estimates are actually a little bit uh, more prevalent than that. Uh, in, the, in the United States, those are CDC numbers. I think it's 1 in 49, unless I checked. Or, um, where, uh, but the, the problem with the numbers is that they're um, based on the number of presenting cases of autism at eight years of age. Not everyone is identified at eight years of age. Um, and there are families that aren't comfortable with that diagnosis being rendered until much later, if at all. Um, so some of those numbers are considered to be perhaps underrepresentative. Uh, we know that in some countries where um, uh, some quasi-experimental uh, studies or, or observational studies have been, uh, have been done, um, that if you actually go into a classroom and literally assess everyone, we can't do, the, do that in the United States because of consent and so on and, uh, and ethics, um, but if you assess everyone in a population or in a classroom, uh, it's closer to about one in 30 or 35 uh, folks is identified. Uh, the numbers do skew toward males, and they're kind of that's kind of a, a hot topic as well. Um, so 
about for every one female diagnosed in the autism spectrum, there's three or four males that are diagnosed. Um, some, uh, a lot of folks feel that females are underrepresented in, in, uh, in diagnoses because uh, they may go under the radar as being, say, the, the, the girl in the classroom who just likes to read a lot. You know, nope, that's not raising any flags for folks, but she may be very fixated on certain topics and, and you know, just be a, you know, just soaking up that information. Whereas if a boy presents with that same behavior, he's somehow out of the ordinary or atypical. And so they, the, the boys are getting uh, assessed earlier uh, and more frequently than, than the girls might, even though they may be presenting similar underlying uh, genetic predispositions. Um, so there's a long answer to what probably should have been a quick question. <laughs> so uh, let's see. Um, as far as uh, autism and culture, just to go over this real quick, the idea of autism being a disorder versus a syndrome versus a condition, deficiency, or difference. Um, any votes for a letter on that one? I, I, would, I would vote for E myself. But there's probably portions of each of these that make sense for certain individuals. Um, so I don't want to disrespect um, the idea of autism as a disorder, but many in the, in the self-advocacy community would say that this is a difference, this is how we were wired, and there's a reason for that. Some, some of us may not be sure that reason is yet, um, but this is kind of how we're wired and we need to be appreciated for who we are in, and also supported with the struggles that we do have. Um, so there's a long history of, of um, of this progression of different identifications being considered a disorder or a deficiency or what have you. Lots of isms that are out there, racism, sexism. Are we talking about autism? Just food for thought. So just putting that out there. Um, so getting into neurodiversity. What exactly is neurodiversity compared to what is autism spectrum? A lot of, a lot of times it's, it's which perspective you're coming from. There is a medical model, if you will, um, that states that you're a person with autism, in other words, a person first, which means the person carrying autism with them, uh, almost like a burden, uh, like a diagnosis, like a cancer, like a whatever it is. Um, and there are some individuals that feel that it's, we need the um, more of a culturally inclusive definition of autism, which is that I'm an autistic person. Uh, Matt Friedman would be in the latter category. Uh, he's, he has the blog, Dude, I'm an Aspie. Uh, which, uh, you know, is a nice little, you say, dude, I'm an Aspie, and then you're a what now? Uh, the other thing, uh, the other uh, caption, if you can't, can't read it, freshly ground autism, sir, just a dash, thanks. Okay, so he sees himself on the autism spectrum, he sees himself as, a, as a, an advocate. Uh, Matt is from, I think, uh, Wilmington, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, but sees, him, uh, sees himself as not necessarily a, Yep, there we go. Not necessarily someone who is deficient, but someone who is different. Um, many examples of autism pride are, are out there these days. Um, the, the, uh, whether it's, uh, I know uh, National Theater has produced uh, The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. There's all kinds of different represent representations of autism in media, in movies, and so on. Some of which are kinder than others, some, but none of which are inclusive of, of the entire autism community. Um, the old saying goes, if, you met, if you've met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. That's just one example of what it is to be on the spectrum or to be neurodiverse. Uh, diversity is a wide, wide uh, range here. Um, so I'm just going to play another little fun clip. This is uh, not necessarily outing anybody as autistic if they are a contestant on Jeopardy, but sometimes that ability to be able to be detail-oriented and, and, and fixated on a certain preferred topic can kind of come in handy. Some things may escape us, though. So here's Alex Trebek's uh, perspective on that. Let's see if I can get this to come up. Uh, football 200. Oh, doesn't Your come up. Do uh, football 200. Your choice, do or don't name in which the quarterback runs the ball and can choose to pitch it to another back. It's an option play. Ryan? <laughs> uh, football 400. I can tell you guys are big football fans. Yeah, yeah. Affected the shotgun formation with this team. Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Dallas Cowboys. Uh, do you think we should go to commercial? <laughs> Ryan? Take it on to 600. Okay, by signaling, a returner can reel in a kick without fear of getting tackled. 
fair catch? 800. These are simultaneous violations by the offense and that cancel each other out. And they are called offsetting penalties. Let's look at the uh, $1,000 clue just for the fun of it. Jimmy? U.S. Bank Stadium prepares to host Super Bowl 52. I'm looking at the Ring of Honor with names from this defensive line that took the Vikings to... If you guys hang in and get this one, I will die. <laughs> Who are the purple people eaters? We're going to take a break. I have to so talk to them. There are certain things that aren't going to be airport things, of course. Um, the question is, can we, you know, kind of roll along with that, not become upset about that, but to kind of use that as part of the endearing nature of our, of our personalities? Um, and that's, that's why a lot of folks that come onto campus, they may not necessarily, uh, if they're on the spectrum or neurodiverse, they may not necessarily feel as included. Um, but rather than being excluded, how can we, again, bridge that, that gap for them? Uh, let's see. I'm going to skip a couple others here. Uh, football 200. Whoops, what did I just do? Your choice. There we go. Uh, football 200. So Your what choice. is it to be neurotypical? What is it to be neurodiverse? Uh, neurotypical means that anyone else who does not identify as neurodiverse, um, just the, the, the you know, 98% or whatever of the rest of us. Um, so this is, you know, kind of tongue in cheek a little bit, but kind of written as if, as a kind of, um, reverse kind of diagnosis on, in, in the DSM. So neurotypical syndrome, that's the rest of us. We have a syndrome, yes we do. Um, is a biological disorder characterized by a preoccupation with social concerns, delusions of superiority, and obsession with conformity. Wouldn't happen on a college campus, of course, no, okay. Uh, neurotypical individuals often assume that their experience of the world is either the only one or the only correct one. NTs find it difficult to be alone. NTs are often intolerant of seemingly minor differences in others. When, group, when in groups, NTs are socially and behaviorally rigid and frequently insist upon the performance of dysfunctional, destructive, and even impossible rituals as a way of maintaining group identity. NTs find it difficult to communicate directly and have a much higher incidence of lying as compared with persons on the autistic spectrum. NT is believed to be genetic in origin, and autopsies of, have shown that the brain of the neurotypical is typically smaller than that of an autistic individual and may have overdeveloped areas related to social behavior, uh, and so on and so forth. So just another way to kind of put this whole diagnostic thing on its head. Um, so therein lies, there we go. Um, so we, we're getting a sense of neurotypical identity and it's not all kind of trashing neurodiverse or neurotypical uh, versus neurodiverse identities. It is a, trying to find a, a, a it's kind of a happy medium somewhere in between. I'm gonna skip through a couple of these. Let's see. Okay, Susan Boyle, of course. You guys remember her from uh, Britain's Got Talent. Okay, speaking for uh, neurodiversity and speaking for those who can't. So this is a, a kind of a growing kind of trend that we see that just because someone may be nonverbal or even selectively mute doesn't mean that they're not showing up on a college campus. Um, so we have folks, uh, uh, let's see, actually, let me skip to the next slide. There we go. Uh, we have folks like Carly Fleischman, uh, who um, uh, for folks that aren't aware of Carly, uh, she's a, a, uh, a, a YouTube host, has been on uh, The Daily Show, has been on HBO's uh, uh, Night of a Thousand Stars, has uh, facilitated conferences and mediated uh, panels with people like John Kerry and so on on autism needs. Um, Carly is still nonverbal. Nobody even knew that she could communicate at all until she was 13 or 14 years old when she started typing away and started hitting uh, what they thought were random letters, but turn, started deciphering and turning them into words, uh, eventually was able to develop her own voice and I believe now has her master's degree uh, and, uh, and is kind of uh, a voice of, of advocates. Amanda Baggs, uh, another self-advocate, uh, has, has an active presence on the internet supporting individuals on the spectrum. Even though she's, uh, she is nonverbal, she has interaction with, uh, within her own kind of objects in her space. She considers that a language in and of itself. I won't play the entire video because we don't have as much time. 
Uh, but the idea that there is a there is a, 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 a world that is not necessarily defined as neurotypicals would define it. Um, you know, these are individuals who are functioning in their own sphere, in their own zone of proximal development, if you will, if you're a Vygotsky fan, um, and are able to be quite successful in those worlds. Um, and they're coming to campuses and asking for our support, our accommodations, whether it's technological or social or even connections with vocational options after they leave here. Um, they, since they do live in their own world to some extent, um, they need that translation from us to be able to walk them into other opportunities. Um, this is Carrie Magro, another individual on the, on the spectrum who you know, has this long list, and I won't go through all of them, um, of you know, what he wishes that people uh, knew about, about uh, uh, folks on the autism uh, spectrum. So, uh, so I wish, I, I like the, the fifth one, I wish that communication becomes easier for everyone with autism. We are trying. So autistic folks are trying to meet us halfway. Neurodiversity is, is, can be an obstacle, but it can also be an opportunity. Um, a student who gives you five words in a classroom may be you know, kind of extending well beyond their comfort zone, and that in and of itself is an effort to connect versus the student next to that, that person who gives you five sentences for every response, the five word response can be just as uh, powerful and just as invested and just as participatory as the person next to that, that, uh, that neurodiverse person um, who's uh, attempting to make that connection. Um, building virtual ramps, and we'll talk about you know, how this happens. Um, this is uh, um, uh, Wendy Ross uh, over on the right. She's one of our, our CNN heroes right over here. Uh, Wendy is a local developmental pediatrician uh, has uh, developed uh, programs uh, that have gone across the country for uh, building the, the, the training models and the, uh, the resources for airlines, for children's museums, for the Smithsonian, uh, for uh, sports complexes. She's trained everyone down at the Eagles, Flyers, Phillies, and uh, Sixers uh, uh, staffs to be able to recognize the, the signs of autism and to be able to create reasonable supports for folks as they are trying to engage and, and facilitate you know, some kind of interaction with their communities. Uh, and families, she's brought families in to be able to give those trainees practice um, and to, to put them kind of in that moment where they're you know, saying, okay, well, we do have a sensory friendly space. We can bring in swoosh or whoever it is, you know, as a special arrangement for certain kids who are overwhelmed with a throng of kids that are rushing the, the mascot or, or whoever it may be, um, to bring that experience to them rather than expecting that they're going to be able to go out and seek that for themselves. Um, so the question is, how do we do that here? Now, it starts with transition planning. I bring this up because um, transition planning is usually a process that happens at about 14 years of age through the graduation of that student um, from high school. That can happen at 18 or all, all the way until 21 years of age. There are some students on campus, and you may or may not be aware of these folks, that are still under their IEP, that are receiving supports not to pay for tuition, but they're receiving supports uh, that are paid for by their uh, school district to be that bridge, to um, provide them an executive functioning coach, for instance, to provide them some, uh, some social coaching, uh, some therapeutic support, so that they can engage in their college experience. Being identified uh, with autism um, uh, on your IAP allows you to access those services through the age of 21, and that's nearly the point where some of our students may be expecting to graduate from Drexel. So just because we are you know, engaging with them here on campus doesn't mean that there isn't a community of support that may be behind them. It is their choice whether or not to disclose that information. Many students don't choose to disclose that information, uh, but it, it is their choice. But all of these systems can start to come to bear on their experience uh, here at college. Um, of course, the transition planning also uh, extends not just into college uh, opportunities, but also has uh, some extension into job opportunities. I'm going to play a, a quick video of, of one of the folks that we work with um, who's you know, given consent to, to share this video, of course. 
Uh, this is Liam, and we're going to take a look at him. I'm a student enrolled at MCCC. In my free time, I volunteer at MANA and as an assistant coach for the Methacton School District. My work history includes being a custodian at North Penn School District and salesperson at Rally House. I also did an internship with the Eagles. I do, I do want to thank you for the opportunity to interview and apologize if seem, if seem nervous. Oh, if I... Sorry. If I seem nervous, as an individual with autism, it takes a little bit more thought to work through the interview process. Hi, I'm Liam, and this is my story. When I was little, my mom noticed that there was something not typical about me. I spent many years trying different kinds of therapy and diets and seeing many kinds of specialists. Eventually, I was diagnosed as being on the spectrum. But there were lots of things about my childhood that were typical, too. I played with my sister when we were little. I learned to play guitar and percussion instruments, sang in the choir, and acted in many productions. I love sports and played baseball, basketball, and my favorite sport of all, football. When I went to high school, my dad talked to the coach about me being on the f It's often difficult for people with autism to make friends and be included. But the high school football team included me, and I joined the team. Through my mom's job and her networking, the Philadelphia Eagles heard about my story. They decided to make a video called uh, Liam McClure. Uh, Viral. Lots of crazy things happened after that. Everywhere I went around my hometown, people recognized me. Through my mom's job, I was invited to throw out the first pitch at a Phillies game. I got to meet some Philadelphia Flyers, Jordan Matthews, and got to introduce Eagles head coach Doug Peterson at an Eagles Charitable Foundation event. Now, to adulthood. Things are different now than when I was a kid, but there are still lots of challenges, like when my dogs act up, or when I tried to interview for a job. When did you find out you had your interview? I just got... A, an email from the manager of Duck Donuts this morning. Oh wow, that happened fast. She wanted me there at, at 4 to 6 p.m. tomorrow. According to Ann Rowe of the A.J. Drexel Autism Institute, when a person with autism transitions to adulthood, it's like falling off a cliff. Most autism support services are provided through school. Services are expensive and hard to get as an adult. Backwards out wide, one on one. Clement flares out to the right, caught over the middle and into the end zone. Zach Ertz for the touchdown. Um, I don't. I didn't really know what they were looking at at the time. To me, it seems. But when they were uh, reviewing it for that long, I mean, that's when doubt. Uh, mm -hmm. A little bit. Giving up wasn't going to be the thing that I do. I just gotta work hard. Give up, never stop, never back down, and never lose faith. The Methacton War Zone 35, moving from our right to our left. Jason Ekman under center. Ekman takes the snap. He's back. He pumps. He's going deep. He's got McClure at the 40, at the 30. At the 20, Liam McClure, touchdown! Touchdown, Methacton Warriors! I am fortunate to have help as I take community college classes part-time. I hope to go on to a regular college. I was able to get an internship with the Eagles this past summer, editing photos of training camp. 
others helped me organize this video and write the script, but I did all the editing myself. Someday, I'd work in sports broadcasting. Until then, I'll keep interviewing for other part-time jobs to get more experience. And that's all there is so to Liam it. So Liam is uh, just about finished his associates. Uh, he's looking uh, for his next steps uh, after MCC or Montgomery or Monco, and uh, and who knows, may end up here on campus. Um, so this is these, this is these are some of the stories that we that we that we work with every day. Um, those strengths are there, and if they're supported properly, um, they can turn into wonderful stories of success. Uh, unfortunately, most folks don't have those kinds of opportunities, but the folks that are here on campus at least have that fighting shot. Um, okay. Okay. As far as uh, as far as the, the numbers that that are here on campus, uh, Amy, you, you serve. What is it now? How many? Sixty five kids that are identified as part of the DAS program here on campus, and Drexel serves how many folks? How many students does Drexel have? Anybody know? Over 20,000. 20, so if we're talking about one in 40-ish people that is on the autism spectrum, we're probably just scratching the surface. You know, 65 is a lot, by the way. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm not minimizing. But you know, we're, we're talking about a huge population here that needs our support. Um, part of this problem is identifying oneself uh, is, is a voluntary thing, and that's even if you know that you're on the spectrum. Um, so there's a, there's a big risk with students coming out and disclosing that they're on the spectrum. You know, not everyone is a Liam who can just you know, lay that in, in front of the media and say, here I am, uh, I'm, I'm a self-advocate and I'm, I'm proud to be autistic. Uh, there are some folks that, that really struggle with that, with that process. There's you know, questions of, of being ostracized, being teased, being bullied. This is the experience that they've had growing up in many ways. Um, there was a, uh, a survey done a couple of years ago. I think it was uh, over two-thirds of parents uh, reported that their uh, children who were diagnosed with autism had been bullied sometime within the past year even. Uh, and those numbers keep on going up when we talk about you know, their, their entire childhoods. Um, so this is a, a constant kind of experience of the world, needing to feel like, um, like you're in danger, that you're a prey animal, as Temple Grandin puts it, Temple Grandin being one of the, the leading autism advocates in the community, um, that, that you're always kind of, kind of being potentially attacked because of the difference that you bring to the table. Uh, so that advocacy and self-advocacy becomes very important. Um, knowing an old friend of mine, Scott Robertson, who's uh, started Autism uh, Self-Advocacy Self -Advocacy Network, ASAN, um, talks about having his AUDIDAR, uh, in other words, your radar for folks who are autistic. And, uh, and we need to be able to develop that ourselves as members of a community that are identifying people that may be neurodiverse, if not autistic, at least neurodiverse, and could use maybe a little bit of support. And the question is how do we, once we identify those people, how do we then gently suggest or even directly suggest that there are certain supports that they might want to seek out? Um, so there are some colleges that do this better than others. Um, there are uh, places that you can guide students to. There's in the state of Pennsylvania, there's the AHEAD program, which is uh, kind of the state funded kind of entity. There's College Living Experience, which has locations all around the country. There are other mentor programs where folks, uh, kids can get, uh, students can get help. Excuse me, uh, through the Rutberg Autism Center where I'm, I'm the director, we have mentors who are matched up with folks on campus, sometimes virtually on their screens through Zoom video conferencing, sometimes hand in hand with them right on campuses, uh, which can be very effective. There's also a new program that grew out of our mentoring program in, in, in many ways. We have some folks that have been working with um, community behavioral health, which is CBH, CBH uh, for folks that don't know, for the city of Philadelphia handles all the medical assistance uh, clients that need support. And uh, uh, just because you may have a, a higher income doesn't mean that you're not eligible for medical assistance if you have an autism diagnosis. So without even realizing it, especially if they have a Philadelphia address, 
um, these students may be eligible to apply for medical assistance with an autism diagnosis and be matched up with a mentor pretty much free of charge um, that is specially trained in a pilot program that we started right here in Philadelphia. Uh, that, that program is trying to be translated into surrounding counties as well. Uh, so the CBH is pushing other insurance companies to be able to provide this, this mentoring assistance. Um, but, uh, but we're hopeful that that will continue. Uh, we also have programs, of course, like the DAS program. I'm not going to toot Amy's horn too much. But, um, but uh, Drexel was uh, the first in the region to really provide specific supports for autistic students on campus. Currently, they're doing it um, free of charge to the students. There are other universities that are charging much higher sums. I think Rutgers University charges, I think, seven or $9,000 additional to, um, uh, to tuition to provide their support. Um, and, uh, and there are other colleges that, that have various uh, arrangements that seem to be changing all the time. Lebanon Valley College uh, in the state of Pennsylvania um, has a very active, as well as Marywood University in Pennsylvania, have very active self-advocacy groups on campus where uh, students have organized um, neurodiversity kinds of groups and are kind of pushing that forward. Um, we have um, uh, Landmark College, uh, Full Sail University and Marino campus, which are in Vermont, um, and then two in, um, uh, I think I believe both Full Sail and Marino are in Florida. I might be wrong on Marino, uh, through Dan Marino's foundation, are specific universities designed for autistic students in particular. So, um, so there are models of how universities can recruit and support students on the autism spectrum. Um, part of that equation uh, is setting up you know, groups that really do you know, kind of bring folks together and, and identify and, and celebrate those differences. NeuroDragons through Drexel is one of those programs where students are, are self-identifying and then organizing some of their own activities uh, with some gentle prodding occasionally <laughs> um, uh, to be able to create a, a, a community of inclusion right here on campus. Um, one, of our, one of our mentors, um, Nate Deacher, talks about how it's a little like cats herding cats, um, that sometimes you know, if you have those social difficulties and then you're trying to mentor others with social difficulties, sometimes there's kind of a, a you know, kind of two ships crossing in the night kind of, or, kind of situation. But you know, with some support um, with folks like Amy and, 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 uh, and others that we have, um, perhaps at the master's level or above, um, that, that kind, of, um, uh, kind of prescription works out pretty nicely. So anything else we wanted to say about that? Nope, okay, all right. Um, so yeah, so send folks to Amy, by the way. Yeah, until she gets to uh, one in 40. She's, she won't be happy, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> um, so what are, the, what are the pieces that we need to be able to develop? And I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, on these, these pieces. Um, but as far as um, what skills we need to be able to foster on campus, um, developing friendships is not just about social connections and opportunities for, for hanging out and going out to parties or what have you. Um, it really is about learning a skill that's translatable later on in other domains. Um, so having friends is great, but learning how to connect with others and to facilitate vocational and recreational and even educational connections um, becomes at least half of the success that our students will, will enjoy once they leave the university setting. Um, it's just a friendship algorithm. Sometimes we have to break it down. We have to give these students particular um, salient levels of, 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 uh, of motivation and skills to be able to get them to develop those connections. Um, so I'm gonna skip through a little bit here. I'm gonna skip through dating. Um, sensory integration. So um, just a quick piece on, on the sensory uh, items. There are some times when we might feel that uh, certain, a certain student is kind of shielding their eyes or maybe a little bit overwhelmed or sitting in the back of the classroom or taking frequent breaks. Um, those are situations when a student might be a little bit overwhelmed with the sensory input that's happening. Some students aren't going to feel um, the, the comfort to be able to reach out and say, I need to take uh, a little bit of a break sometimes or I need to you know, be excused every once in a while. They may not have a letter of accommodations from the disabilities office to be able to say that. 
um, like explicitly on paper that they need to be afforded certain breaks. Uh, but those are situations when we can, just as the, as the situation that I mentioned earlier on Camelback Mountain, where we as a community jump in and say, um, is there something that would be helpful? Should we turn the lights down a little bit? Is there some, is there some way that, um, that we can, say, turn down the volume on, on, the, um, on, the, uh, speak, on the overhead speaker or what have you? These are things that we can um, address kind of voluntarily without necessarily having to reinvent the wheel. Um, there are certain folks that need some kind of, you know, items or adjustments in their, in their environment. They may not know what those are necessarily, but at least we can offer ourselves and uh, let them know that there's someone that's, that's, that's trying to meet their needs. Um, I was uh, working with one individual who uh, was recently, uh, her, her instructor was recently replaced with someone else. There was some shuffling going on in the department. And the new instructor wasn't aware that she needed breaks uh, and that, uh, that she needed to get up and kind of, you know, walk around the back of the classroom every once in a while and then come back to her seat. Um, and that she needed a, a little, you know, like little um, uh, thinking putty to play with while she was in class. And the instructor basically asked her to, you know, sit down and be still and you're distracting others and this isn't helpful, um, which may have been true. Uh, to some extent, but what it in fact did was put the instructor in the uh, position of being the bad guy. And, uh, and so, you know, also there were other folks in the class that were aware that she was previously receiving those accommodations. When that instructor shut that down, it kind of put them in a very precarious position. That trust, regardless of the, the, the skills of the instructor, um, that, that trust was broken down very quickly. Um, so we, what, before we make a judgment on how people are engaging with us, to think, could this person be neurodiverse in some way on the spectrum or ADHD or what have you? Um, so let's see, we're going to skip through here. Um, we talked about the, uh, the, the concept of, of translating social skills, and we'll talk a little bit more in, in depth about that if we have time here. Um, yeah, we're good. We're good. Um, translating social skills into vocational opportunities. So it's not just about making friends here on campus, it's about you know, how does it actually um, make a difference in our lives. For some of the, the, the students here on campus, we provided vocational skills workshops. Um, the, the idea was to, um, to identify okay, the importance of the employability, transition success, social vocational skills, uh, by developing those, by develop those peer um, uh, skills, social skills, uh, translating into professional uh, social uh, networking skills. Um, so this is just, oh, by the way, this is uh, the gentleman I mentioned, Nate, the guy who says it's like cats herding cats. Um, so he was uh, being recognized for his work up uh, on the Sixers scoreboard um, at, I think it was halftime or something, uh, with the cheerleaders there. He was quite happy about that. <laughs> Um, so what we found with the vocational skills workshop is we were seeing that over time, the self ratings of folks, and this is not an ex a, a, a great experimental design, this is just you know, a low N and so on, but what we did find was that pre and post at least, we were seeing an improvement or a lessening of severity in the overall uh, uh, symptoms that folks were displaying um, in the context of working on their vocational skills. And these were self-reported, so there's a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, but you know, initially, you know, uh, exciting stuff. Um, so we know that we're onto something here. Um, and providing those the theoretical foundations, what we're looking at uh, in, in getting these skills across, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here, um, is the idea of Yuri Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory, you know, where the person is in the center and then they have the family and the neighborhood and the, you know, all the other systems kind of branching out around them. The idea is we have circles around us, people that are closest to us, next closest and tertiarily closest to us, um, that help us succeed in each of our life domains. Um, so this, you know, the center domain over here might be our social domain. And over on this side, you know, we might have our vocational domain over here. And up here, we might have our educational domain with all of our study buddies. Underneath here, there might be a, a, a recreational domain or a spiritual domain. All of these different domains in our lives have kind of concentric circles of, of people that we can literally map out, literally draw into those circles to say, okay, who is closest with us right now? Who is next closest to us? 
How do I want these people to function for me? Where are the holes, the open slots in my circles where I can work to insert people into those positions so that I can have opportunities moving forward? And then, of course, how often do I need to maintain those relationships in order for them to remain close to me? Um, so that process is, 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 a, is an ongoing process. It's a cyclical process. It's a malleable process, which can be very frustrating for a lot of folks on the spectrum. Sometimes we want things just a certain way. We don't like change. We don't like to transition. We want things to just be set for us. Social circles are not set. Social circles are dynamic. Um, or educational circles, if you will. The people that are in your class change next semester or quarter. We're in quarters, quarters. Remember which university I'm at. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so as, as those classes change, our educational circles shift. How many of our previous quarter classmates do we want to maintain in that educational domain? How do we do that? Where do we make those connections? Are there phone numbers? Are there platforms? Are there LinkedIn? What is the nature of our communication and our, our connection moving forward? And then how does that leave us additional slots in our circles to be able to add folks back in? So you may have, in the social uh, sense, you may have acquaintances on the outside, which are great for bringing you opportunities. A person who knows somebody is a very handy person to have. Even if you aren't spending a lot of time with them, I know a guy who knows a guy, and that's who, where that opportunity comes from. Um, the middle circle would be the regular friends, maybe a, a once a week kind of interaction, that you, meaningful interaction that you might have with somebody in a social sense. It's kind of a mutual agreement that this is, this is our domain, we're doing the social thing right now, or maybe as a classmate, we're doing the educational thing right now, or maybe it's romantic, we're doing the romantic thing right now. We have to you know, determine what, what domain that person is gonna be in. So there's certain folks we're gonna do on a weekly basis. And then that inner circle, your core friends, somebody that you connect with on pretty much a daily basis, sometimes even multiple times per day, that there's some meaningful connection there that needs to be maintained. Um, and that's a very dynamic kind of present piece uh, of, of our lives. Um, we have equivalents of this all across our different, our different domains. So here we have the domains down here, social, romantic, familial, vocational, educational, spiritual, recreational, the list goes on. And we call these people different things depending on which, we call people in these circles different things depending on which domain they are in our lives. Um, so you know, the middle circle may be in the familial will be your extended family, whereas your inner circle will be your nuclear family at certain points in your life. Um, your vocational, well, those are called colleagues or the close ones would be coworkers, classmates or study buddies if they're really close to you. And these are, these are positions in our lives that shift over time. Mapping this out for folks, especially who are neurodiverse, that are visual thinkers, tends to be very effective. Um, it, also, <clears throat> it also makes a difference to, um, speaking of visual thinking, to be able to structure things in a visual way, by the, by the way, to the folks that, are, that we're working with. Um, so we'll talk about those, those tips a little bit later on. Um, sometimes we get to a certain, we, we earn certain points over time, certain unkind un of quantifiable but quasi-quantifiable social capital points. So there's a social currency that kind of feeds our, our, our systems, the, the way that we interact with each other on a daily basis. And when we accumulate a certain amount of social capital, that maintains our relationships and brings additional opportunity or additional kind of resources to that relationship that we can cash in when we need to. The nice thing about social capital is when you cash it in, sometimes you earn more social capital because sometimes when you do somebody a favor, you feel closer to that person as a result of doing that favor. Many folks on the autism spectrum don't realize that. They feel that, um, that if they're uh, asking somebody to do something, they're being a burden to them or that they're, they're, they're extinguishing whatever capital they had with them. Sometimes we need to realize that sometimes asking for help is the best way for us to make a connection. Coming to office hours actually increases your educational capital with your professor. As professors, asking students to come and spend time with us during those, those office hours can be one of the best gifts. You're essentially giving a green light to that student to be able to come and join you at that time. Now, they may be a, a little bit nervous about that, um, but I, I think as, as uh, when, whenever I teach, I, I feel like I'm just twiddling my thumbs during my office hours waiting for somebody to show up. 
Uh, I'm not sure if you guys, I'm sure, have full offices all the time. So no judgment there. <laughs> but, um, but you know, kind of opening that up for folks allows them to develop that social capital. Um, let's see, we're going to skip through some of these real quick. Um, as we're, now, the question is, how, are, how is it that I'm going to uh, develop social capital or vocational capital or educational capital? Kind of like a little bit of a football play. So there's social, sh these things called social shapes. So when you walk into a room, there's kind of a, a, a uh, geographical kind of orientation that people have. Now, right now, our geographical orientation is like a set of semicircles all pointing toward me in this screen because that's the nature of lectures and how we go about those social shapes. So there's, this is our social shape right now, and it happens to be also pretty amenable to eating food. Okay? If there's no food, chances are we're in rows and everybody's facing forward, and that's kind of how the, the, the social shape turns out. With, <clears throat> with many people on the autism spectrum, they're not necessarily looking at the orientation of people. They're looking at the, the movement or the, the sensory kind of features of a certain place. And so they may walk into a room or a classroom and not necessarily recognize where it is that they can be sitting. So say, say I have um, two lovely uh, participants up here. They're just voluntarily by volunteering just by sitting here. So if I'm an autistic uh, person, I'm looking to come into a social shape between two people that happen to be triangulated and looking toward me, this is the natural place that I would step into. But if I'm on the spectrum, I may not realize that. I may be over here, I may have my back turned, I may be looking at my phone, and I'm missing this potential for a, a, a social interaction entirely. Okay, so sometimes we literally draw these little kind of football diagrams. That's just an example up there, um, and and we say, okay, well, where is it that you can safely work into a social shape? So when you enter a classroom and there's two students who are talking and they happen to have not their squares shoulder to each, you know, squared off uh, with their shoulders, but they happen to be open like this, your natural position is to create that triangle or to finish that square. Uh, if you want to add in other people to that, to that uh, social shape, you would, in kind, turn, open up your shoulders and make space for another person to magically appear at a predetermined spot that you've non-verbally communicated to your, your, uh, your conversation mates that there is room in our conversation for someone to exit. Or you start to move away as it's time to leave or, or what have you. These are social shapes that not necessarily everyone on the autism spectrum recognizes. But as neurotypicals, we automatically just intuit this and we just flow with those shapes. Um, so let's see. We're going to skip through some of this because we're not going to have time for everything. Um, once you are in that social shape, uh, the idea is there's a certain structure to the communication. And this is, this is uh, the case with job interviews. This is the case with you know, meeting with your professor in, during office hours. <clears throat> to some extent, it's a, it's a process of, you know, if you want to establish uh, study buddies or, or you know, classmates that could potentially be helpful to you, this is, um, this is a, an unspoken structure. So, so you know, what is the topic? Um, you're going to identify what that topic is, whether it's a global topic that anybody can talk about, just strangers, a local topic, in other words, what's happening around you in that classroom, or a personal topic if you happen to know something uh, that you've already talked about with that person that's specific to that person. You're going to ask a question, listen carefully to their response, and then share a little bit about what you think about that. Repeat three times until that person either asks you a question in return or you do not get a question return, and you need to move on from that conversation. So three strikes and you're out. Very simple, structured, and if we go through that process, it tends to be successful. This is an underlying um, uh, structure of communication that not everyone uh, intuits. At some point, if there is a question return, that's a 50-50 conversation, uh, and when that conversation becomes lopsided, we're going to restart the matrix or say, see you later. That process of rehearsing communication over and over and over again allows people to become more successful in those kind of social, vocational, educational settings. Uh, depending, oh, by the way, depending on how well they do in this three by three matrix determines how much social capital they're earning. And we can actually score that um, and, and literally reinforce with points how people are doing. So one point is you make it through a three by three 
Two points is the other person asks a question in return. Three points, you get into a full 50-50 conversation. Four points, multiple 50-50 conversation with different topics. Five points, should we, uh, we should talk again or, or uh, uh, when should we get together? So in other words, saying that people want to repeat that experience. Okay? Um, and over time, once you get up to a certain amount of social capital, say 500 to 1,000 social capital points, we consider those, those friends uh, or colleagues lifelong connections. And so they become that important to us that we don't necessarily need to maintain them in our social circles all the time. They kind of become solidified in our, in our uh, circle of connections. Kind of in the center of that, of that square, by the way. Uh, let's see. So trust, we're going to skip through this. We're going to get to the good stuff. <clears throat> Not that you all need to. We're going to do some relaxation exercises, but I'll skip that. You guys all look relaxed anyway. So we're all right. Um, okay, so tips and tricks. Um, and then I want to open up for a couple questions at the end here, too. Um, so encouraging self-advocates to access supports on campus and beyond. Okay, your own Audidar has to start going off when you're seeing students that whether or not they have a letter of accommodation um, that might need a little bit of assistance. Um, and then to gently suggest that, you know, I noticed that you seem to be a little uncomfortable in class, taking them aside afterwards or what have you. Is there something that, you know, that we can help with here in class or is, uh, is that something that, um, you know, that might be helpful to talk to a mentor about or what have you? And then you call Amy. Um, and, then, uh, and then encouraging those educational circles among students. So there may be certain situations where you can look across your class and identify how certain individuals in the classroom might work together with other students. Not that we're assigning necessarily um, obligatory kind of you know, um, project partners or what have you, uh, but there might be some gentle suggestion or gentle maneuvering of that classroom structure that allows people to be near people who can be helpful to them, kind of developing those wing people. Staying strengths-based and open-minded. Um, strengths-based, recognizing that even though that student may be a bit quirky in their own way, um, <clears throat> there may be some unexpected comments that are being shared. That that person, that the nature of those comments is coming from a, a, a genuine place of, of uh, intellectual interest and may not, even though they may not have the full concept that, uh, that solidified in their comments or their participation, that they are actively pursuing that. There are some folks that, um, that take a little bit longer than the expected one second interval um, that we have built into our communication practices um, that elapses between people speaking. Usually it's less, less than about one second. If you aren't able to have a comment ready within one second, you're glazed over. Part of the problem is that many folks in the autism spectrum are processing information in the visual cortex that would typically, for most of us, be processed through our auditory or, um, or uh, uh, the Broca's and Wernicke's area for speech. Um, so it may take them a little extra second or two to process that information. Sometimes giving them that, <clears throat> that little break, that little um, uh, hesitation, the, the, the prompt delay, if you will, allows them to properly respond to what you're asking as a question. You can state uh, your, your question, you can wait a second, you can restate it or rephrase it, and then wait three to five seconds for that response to come. You may find a better response that way. That person has then been given the time to process what they're thinking about and then deliver that response. Recognizing neurodiversity as a form of diversity, not necessarily or only a disability. And we talked about that a little bit earlier. Encouraging students to utilize accommodations in their letters from disability services. So I, I talk with some professors sometimes that they'll get, <coughs> excuse me, losing the moisture in my voice. Um, they'll get a letter uh, from the disabilities office, either through email or maybe the student deliver, hand delivers it, um, and that student chooses not to access those accommodations. There's a reason why that student has gone through the trouble or was prompted to go through the trouble of presenting a disability to the disabilities office and then to access that accommodation. So whether it's extended time or small group testing or what have you, <coughs> testing in a different setting, um, you, you may recognize that they're not utilizing it. Really encouraging them and giving them the green light, giving them permission um, to, to stand up and advocate for themselves and even the expectation to advocate for themselves 
completes that circle. The accommodations are there for a reason. A reason. Um, professors need to collaborate with self-advocates. Uh, so it, it, this is, even if, it, it's, if, if it's not um, a requirement on the disabilities letter, things like sharing slides or, or, or uh, notes or even uh, making connections between students to share notes back and forth or to collaboratively take notes, um, to encourage recording of lectures, um, to encourage time sampling, so, so taking notes not based on what the student finds is important in the moment, but to, take, to encourage the class as a whole to take notes once every minute, every once in a while, they need to do that. What happens is that most students are taught to take notes about what's important, whether it's what the professor writes up on the board, uh, whether there's an assignment due, or whatever it may be. Um, if you're forcing yourself to take a note every minute, a time sample every minute, um, of what you thought was important in that last minute, then you can go back later and glean through what you think was truly important, what was popping up more frequently. Um, and that allows you to structure your notes a little bit more efficiently. So sometimes we need to encourage students to do that as well. Office hours, we talked a little bit about that. Um, just because um, a student is heard at one time doesn't mean it's getting through. We uh, work in the, we used to say, the Department of Repetition and Redundancy Department. Uh, which means that you need to be able to repeat things for people to get it, uh, especially on the autism spectrum. Um, many folks have, are remembering great amounts of detailed information, but not necessarily what parts of those details are most important. It's only by repeating the important stuff that that memory is encoded enough time so it's more easily accessible. Okay? So that repetition becomes super important uh, for these students. Um, parents, this is interacting with parents, of course, but um, parents need to support but allow their children the opportunity to fail. Sam Huber, who's done some mentoring here at Drexel as well, um, <clears throat> had a, a session he called Cut That Cord, okay, kind of a blunt you know, message to parents. Sometimes we feel that, uh, or a student may feel that they're being kind of controlled or pushed into a certain course or a certain major or what have you by parents. And giving the encouragement of that student to use their own voice, their own self-advocacy, to say what it is that they want from their curriculum, what it is they want from their major, they want from their classes, that voice is, is incredibly important. Not just, and also, not just what we want as, as educators, but what they want as students needs to be held up. Um, encourage executive functioning, organizations, study guides, planners, chunking of information so we're doing little bits at a time, and task analyzing. Um, these are all things that are helpful for all students and reminding students that you know, we need to be able to maintain that planner, maintain that, you know, the, the importance of you know, a rank ordering of the importance of assignments and how much time we're spending on each, very helpful. Uh, having students repeat back what they think the assignment is about. And this is you know, helpful for the whole class. I've had um, students you know, come, you know, come back and, and say, well, I thought the assignment was this, but I did this. And they may have done a fabulous job with the other whatever it is that they were focused on, but they missed the entire assignment and what the nature of the assignment was. So really checking in, having them repeat back, what am I asking you to do? Tell me what it is to make sure that that understanding is getting across. Um, encouraging group studying to study uh, sessions, online discussion groups, et cetera. Is, is there a platform that Drexel uses to maintain student connections or, or discussions for classes, whatever that platform is? Yeah. It's not automatically developed. I really encourage that to be, to be developed. With students on the autism spectrum, they're of, often more comfortable developing those connections online. So if there's an online discussion for that classroom, they're much more likely to access their stu the other students in the class um, <clears throat> and to ask questions. And oftentimes, they're the stars of that online discussion group. Um, they're the ones with all the inf information that other students want to have as well. So this, is, this works both ways. Um, open this, opening the doors uh, for identifying as neurodiverse. So, you know, kind of whenever possible, you know, highlighting uh, the nature of diversity or neurodiversity on our campus, <clears throat> allowing them to self-disclose if they choose to. Um, we're not outing somebody, but we're saying, okay, this is an okay subject to talk about. And when one person self-discloses in a class or in an activity or an on-campus event, 
um, it validates all the other uh, students who are a little bit less likely to self-disclose. <clears throat> so it's not just for them, it's for everyone else as well. And then getting students to understand the differences between uh, IDEA and ADA. There's the last thing I'll, I'll mention. Hey, I got 25 seconds left. Okay. Um, to be able to realize that IDEA, which protects their education as a child before they graduate from high school, that is a, that is a, a, a right that they're given, uh, that uh, other people identify that for them, and there's responsibility of educators and, and parents and so on to be able to provide those services. That all stops when we enter the adult world. We enter college, unless they happen to have a, a, a co-occurring IEP. When we enter college, Americans with Disabilities Act provides those supports, but only what is, quote, reasonable supports for them to access their curriculum, job, et cetera. Um, and the protections are very vague. Uh, each um, university has their own uh, interpretation of what reasonable accommodations may be. And they tend to change from time to time as well, depending on what resources that university has to offer. Um, so getting students to understand that their rights are, uh, are a little bit interpretable, uh, depending on whether they're in the university, but also when they go on to their jobs. They're going on to their co-ops. They're going on to internships and, and positions later on. These are skills to be able to self-advocate um, <clears throat> and ask for what they need to be successful super important because otherwise I get human resources directors coming back to me and say, I didn't want to fire this person, but I had to because they left me no choice. If, I, if they had disclosed that there was a disability, I would have been able to make an accommodation. I want to make that accommodation because now the feds are coming after them. If they don't hire and support, eight, I think it's 8% of their workforce with a person, you know, of people with disabilities. So it's, it's on employers, it's on universities to be able to not just talk the talk, but walk that walk of supporting individuals with, with disabilities to, to the reasonable nature of what they need to be successful. And the return is great. Um, a little bit of effort on our end, a whole lot of reward on the back end. So thank you all very much for coming today. I'm sorry if I talked too quickly, um, but if there's any questions, I'll hang around for a little bit. All right. That's you too. <laughs> All right. Let's see. I have a question. Sure. Gotcha. Sometimes interpret that as they get double time on project-based work, and we do a project a week. So when they push a project a week, and we push the other one a week, by the time we are halfway through the term, they turn in one thing, and everybody else turns in five. So wow. how do I sort of address this idea of need for more time when we have a very time-sensitive like program of like work, and I don't yep. give written tests or exams or require them to under pressure, they do a lot of their stuff on their own at home, and we give them desks within our, within our studio space for them to work. So it's interesting how to navigate this. Right. So, and, and not to, to tell you how to grade, but um, there is um, some precedent for proportional grading, um, which is very controversial, of course, if a student is able to reflect a certain um, level of mastery and they don't necessarily finish all 27 items or whatever it is in, or assignments or what have you, that they're graded based on their performance in that area. Um, that's something that obviously needs to be predetermined before we just jump into a class and so on. But that is one strategy to, you know, so that we're not <coughs> affording extra time, but we're also making some kind of an accommodation uh, around that. The other thing I would say is to really encourage students to recognize the, the nature of what you're trying to teach. Um, that uh, there are certain things that you may not be able to adjust and reflective of what happens in the job place, um, they may not have a whole lot of time to beat a deadline. You know, if you have, if your boss says, you know, have this finished by Tuesday, you should probably have it done by Tuesday um, because that, that's, that's the deadline. 
Um, and, uh, and sometimes when that firm deadline is given, you may find that that productivity increases. Um, so we need to be able to be, not just have an accommodation, but also to flex, individuals on the spectrum need to be able to flex at least halfway to the expectations that are out there as well. And that's what I've so. asked of them the most times they do that, but I have had students that mm -hmm. really push back hard on this, like three times Yep. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's a tough balance. So, um, no, it's a good question, because I think that, you know, statistically speaking, if one thing is a little different, then it's more likely that something else is genetically different as well. Um, so autism, uh, genetically speaking, and not, not to exclude the environmental influences and so on, but uh, genetically speaking is um, uh, reflective of, I think it's over 100 different genes now, that are more or less likely to be repeated or deleted in the genetic sequence. And there's no one kind of pattern of genetics that specifies autism. So it is a little bit of a hodgepodge, kind of a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and by the time it all presents itself genetically, you have folks that look very different on the same autism spectrum. Uh, and so the, that those genetic factors you know, do play around with other uh, medical factors as well. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, Mother Nature kind of, you know, playing a little bit of Russian roulette a little bit. Um, but that's a little bit morbid. Let's see. Uh, blackjack, is that better? <laughs> so, yeah. No problem. No, I, I think it's it would be phenomenal to to have um, to have that included in a syllabi or even just verbally, you know, translate to the entire classroom. Um, it, it, this is a, a, a facsimile of community, uh, and you know, as a community, we try to um, create norms and, and expectations that facilitate the success of that community. And if there's something you can do for one student, may very well work for a majority of the other students as well. Um, you know, I've, I know, you know, teachers who have, you know, for of younger kids who, um, you know, there was one, you know, one situation I can think of where the kid, there was one kid that had an exercise ball chair, but didn't want to feel excluded from the classroom. So what the school did was bought exercise ball chairs for all the kids. So you would think that now you have these kids bouncing on these exercise ball chairs all day long, but what happened is they were actually improving their posture because you don't want to fall off an exercise ball, right? Um, they were improving their posture and their, their attention as an entire class improved. So some of these accommodations do translate in, in unexpected ways to help other students also. Yeah, that's great. All right. So, I, yeah, one more. They didn't have this awareness. They didn't have, you know, uh, any of those. So what, what, what do you do with the students? Like, they don't know. I mean, they, yep. of course they know they are different. They feel awful. They feel, you know, right.
Yeah, I mean, the, the diagnostics um, you know, are often late in coming. And, and there are some students that don't, that, that they know perhaps that they think a little differently than other folks. And by the way, I'm, uh, for folks I, I, I should have mentioned before, uh, we do have a vocational networking preparation support thing that we've arranged uh, with Drexel if folks do need specific supports. So there's those, as well as my cards are up here, if folks are interested. Um,